morning, everyone. My name is Dan Spitzer from Hobbs and Ross. I'm very pleased to have the honor to uh, host this panel on disruptive finance in the renewable energy business. The idea of disruptive finance as it relates to renewable energy is especially interesting given that renewable energy itself is somewhat of a disruptive technology that's changing our worlds. Uh, about 130 years ago, the people in the communities I work with actually got $100,000 together in Buffalo, New York to pay somebody to figure out how can we harness the energy from Niagara Falls. And it was a way of raising money to try to encourage people to do so, and they were unsuccessful. But about 30 years later, a gentleman named Morgan was able to figure out how to finance such a plan for Niagara Falls, and our firm helped them to finance and put together the first long-distance power line from Niagara Falls to Buffalo. If you look at the history of renewable energy, it's not only been disruptive, it's also interesting to know, a few weeks ago, one of the leading financial publications, The Economist, talked about what was mankind and woman's kind the greatest invention, to fire, was the wheel. And they suggested that perhaps the greatest invention of our civilization has been the financial contract. They suggested that the ability to manage risk, to pool funds, to collectively undertake large-scale projects, is really what has made our civilization happen. And if you look at the modern discussions of renewable energy, the kind of things that we just talked about in the last panel, how are we gonna finance microgrids? Who's gonna pay for them? What's happening to the utility model? All of this gets to a very disruption in what has been, for the last 100 years, a fairly solid model of energy delivery. So this is a very exciting time to be involved in our industry. It's a very exciting time to be involved in these, with these uh, processes, and I'm very pleased to have a panel with me of individuals who are on the cutting edge of these things. Uh, Benjamin Neely from uh, Connecticut Finance, Energy Finance Investment Authority, has been involved for a long time on the public side of helping to finance projects, put together the, if you will, the grease to make projects go, and has been a leader in public uh, partner partnerships, which is really what we're talking about here in terms of this panel and in terms of a lot of things we're looking at. On the private side, Christopher uh, P. Uh, is an investment banker at Bank of America, a bank that I'm very fond of since it's my bank, um, and uh, the, uh, he has been a leader in uh, acquisitions and mergers in this industry, has worked for one of the largest companies involved, and he's been hands-on in making the things come to be through Together these, some of these difficult transactions. Finally, Jessica Aldridge uh, may have one of the commenters in one of the emails that we shared. She may have the toughest job of all. All she has to do is help figure out how to invent the public private partnership from the ground up with no taxpayer dollars and make everybody happy. She is with the new Green Bank. Uh, she comes to us from the Department of Energy before that. The Fox News Alert. She had nothing to do with cilantro, so she wasn't involved there. But she has been an expert in exactly the kind of things that we're talking about here. Putting together unique methods of putting together um, financial deals. So welcome to the panel. Um, I'd like to start by asking each of you to tell us a little bit about what you're doing specifically in this area. Give us maybe a little summary of what you're working on. And we'll start with uh, Ben and Ken. Sure. Well, thank you, Dan. And uh, very much a pleasure to be here with you all. Like I said, I love this space. I no idea it existed. So, uh, I work for the Connecticut Green Bank, recently renamed because it's an energy finance investment plan. It was both too hard to say and were inspired by what's going on in New York in terms of uh, a model for green banks around the country. Uh, as we grow in Cephia, or now the Connecticut Green Bank, we've been around for a few years. A rate payer funded, uh, system benefit charge funded uh, pool of capital uh, specifically designed to accelerate the employment of clean energy in Connecticut. And for those of you who are not active in Connecticut, I would still say this might be an interesting story because of what's happening in New York more broadly about the country, around the country, and a new model for uh, government intervention to support the financing of uh, renewable energy pretty broadly. So I have three key points I want to make, and then I'll shut up and pass it off to my much smarter colleagues up here on the panel uh, can address the discussion more broadly. Three points. Point one. Um, in the context of the title of this panel, Disruption, uh, what Stephia thinks
context of the dark hole is uh, innovate within the context of the market. Uh, I was thinking on the way here this morning, it's almost like a bride on a wedding day. It's almost something old, something new, something violent, something blue. Uh, I'm working on this. I think it might need some more work. The idea is, well, it's not blue, it's green. So that's, that doesn't get me there. It's borrowed, definitely, because we're all about leverage and finance. And the old and the new is the way in which what we're trying to do is bring a little bit of a twist using our ability to take risks uh, into a market that, in a variety of ways, doesn't function as clean as we want. And so what I mean when I say that is, for example, our residential silver loan program, we're set the warehouse, a product uh, created by a company called Sungage, a solar-optimized loan product with an alternative for those who didn't want to do traditional leasing at this point. It's funny to say traditional, but there is a traditional third-party ownership structure. Sungage came up with this product. They originated the service for us. Sethia holds on our books. Okay, and we found a partner in Mosaic as the investor crowdsourcing the investment side of the house. So we've got a solar optimized product. We've got a crowdsourced investment on the, on the back end. But it's actually something pretty traditional. It's just a collateralized loan obligation. It's a pool of assets that we're creating on our books, selling them off. Sethia is holding some of the risk. Nothing on that fancy actually being there. Similar to our seed-based program, property assessment and energy, you know, a borrower, the commercial borrower takes out a, a loan from Cephia to finance an energy upgrade, energy efficiency, HVAC, what have you. And for us, that's pretty broad. That can be solar, that can be fuel cells, that can be a bunch of things. Um, we own it. We warehouse that on our books. And then we took it out through a boutique investment firm and a home fund. That, you know, what's new is we'll potentially transform it into the base mechanism. What's old? It's just an ABS structure that we put together. It's just a simple bond structure. So, overriding point. One that I want to make is the government role here is experimenting with some new financial mechanisms to get us into capital markets that aren't even having play. Okay. Point two, segue from that. The government role here is not going to continue to subsidize this market. We all know that's the case. But nor is it to crowd out private capital, as I think most folks in this room know. There's tons of money sitting on the sidelines. The question is, how do you get in the game? How do we get Chris to feel really good about putting his money, his clients' money to work in this space? And so, Cephia doesn't want to be the one who met the Green Bank. I'd be curious to hear Jessica's thought uh, of saying, we're going to finance something, okay, now the private sector, you don't have to. Rather, our role is to say, there's a market, whether it's low income, uh, or multifamily on the residential side, or a particular interest to me these, these days, nonprofits and mid market commercial, where you can't get financing to do solar, for example. So, how does the Green Bank step in and play a role to show the market that there's actually a path to increase the creditworthiness of these borrowers using something like the pay structure? And right now, we're rolling out the first third party owned, pay secured solar leasing vehicle in the country. And what it does is open up for the whole market the ability to go after nonprofits and mid market commercial that otherwise would not be financeable. And I would want to do it for a year. And then I would want to say, okay, here's the model. Go to town, everybody else. Okay, point two. Point three, very quickly. We all talk about affordable capital. That's what we want to drive this market. That's what we know we need to have it look like other markets that function on their own. And the chicken and the egg problem is origination. And so, well, I'm interested in talking to all the capital providers in this room, all the developers in this room. What I really want is the guy who can say, here's my origination machine because it's scale and standardization that allow us to get to where we need to go. And if Cephia, the Green Bank, and other Green Banks can play a role in helping with that aggregation of a good originator machine that can drive, whether it's residential, commercial, what have you, the scale and standardization, then I think we've got something kind of sexy. So those are my three points. I'll shut up now. Chris? Sure, thank you. Appreciate it. I'm Chris Bay from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, an investment banker working with Howard at Renewables Group. We cover all clients through the Howard Renewables platforms, but my focus has been mainly around the renewable space. We've been at the forefront of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, on public yield codes and also how public yield codes can actually go and acquire assets. And in particular, we've also been recently focused on the distributed generation space. Um, actually, it's inaccurate to say recently because we were one of the first banks to uh, lend to SolarCity on, 
project so strong, and also to project man, which was an energy and co-op as a generation transaction. We've been doing recently tax activity transaction for Resi and commercial distributed generation, and also we've been focused on creating a newer product called the debt aggregation facility, in which we are aggregating multiple tax equity funds and lending against the residual cash flows. So that's what I've been focused on, and happy to be here. Thanks. Hi, um, Jeff Aldrin from the New York Green Bank, and you know it's uh, challenging to to give an overview uh, now uh, on on the heels of my boss, who's in the audience here, Alfred Griffin, and, and he did a great job this morning. So, so what can I add to that? Really, nothing, but I'm going to try. Um, you know, we're you know, like Ben said, we're, we're in the business of um, incubating underserved transaction types. For deployment of commercially proven, uh, proven um, to, to a state in which um, you know the, the market has been exposed to them, at least in other applications or contexts, um, uh, in a way that is standardized and drives scale, in a way that brings in capital in much bigger and broader ways. And so, you know, we're not a bank, we're a fund, and we're really looking for opportunities in which we can engage in unique transactions in, in, for a little while in a way that we can expose banks, capital providers that are more likely investors, not even as a green bank might go away. So it's really exciting. I mean, we've seen a lot of things come through where you know, there are size issues where we might be a warehouse capital provider on a short-term basis. Uh, you know, it's too small for a bank to pay attention to it on its own. But they say, you know what, if you guys can fund a portfolio up to $25 million, we'll come in and buy it from you. And those are definitely a lot of things we think we'll be doing. You know, we can be direct investors in projects or, or you know, certain application of technologies in those projects if we can do it in a way that brings in other capital providers. So, you know, we can be a subordinate piece in that structure if we're bringing in another lender, or otherwise we can engage in the project and, and, and the like. And so, it, it's exciting and happy to be here and answer your question. Let's delve into some of the specifics that we've been talking about here. Uh, ben, you mentioned about the C-PACE program. Pace came along, was especially looked at as a positive on the residential side. Unfortunately, the federal housing authorities uh, put some terms in the program in terms of the willingness to take on the debt uh, or allow the debt to be taken on, really. But Connecticut has really stepped up to the plate. The legislature has supported the program uh, and, 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 and asked if it could kind of be that one of your focuses. Give us a background on the C Pace program. I'm kind of curious, not too, now that we've seen a few years of the program, how it's working out in terms of Payment structures, uh, spheres of defaults, or uh, how it would work in transferring. Some of the insights that you can give us now in the work with the space program. Yeah, so, you know, I, I am not of the silver bullet mentality with, with regards to any kind of clean energy finance mechanism. I think we're in the business of experimentation with uh, you know, various structures that could help drive uh, demand and uptake among different segments. Having said that, the power of property accessible energy, I think, is real, and Connecticut has demonstrated that with an appropriately built infrastructure uh, from the administration point of view and a clean capital uh, you know, flow, uh, you can make these things work. And so, you know, the first, we're really only done about a year's worth. Uh, we've approved and funded uh, between 20 and 30 million, depending on which day of the week uh, we're, we're sort of inching up. And, have about, I'd say, $75 million worth of deals that we think we'll do this year. Uh, what's important in Connecticut, and lessons for other states that have sort of passed pace laws and haven't seen anything happen, is we have a statewide administrator in the Green Bay. We do the technical work, we do the financial work. The municipalities really just serve as cheerleaders for their building owners, and then collections and security mechanism passing that through back to us and from us back to the investor. What's amazing is, is about this is really it's not you know your traditional green guy who's coming and taking advantage of the program. It's, it's local not for not for profits that you know recognizing that they're paying way too much for, for their oil either looking for a fuel conversion, uh, doing a boiler upgrade. It's manufacturers who say, hey you know I've got a huge energy load and, and solar actually can play play a role here. Um, and so it's opened up the market. Uh, it it allows for this you know. It in itself is this credit enhancement that gets our capital providers banging on the doors that have to say it's, again, the hardest problem for us and it's not, it's not capital, although structuring it appropriately, making it work simple, easy is, is all important, uh, as well as you know, the risk profile. But folks want access to this market because of the, the 
power of it. And it's really about uh, how do you uh, package these projects, not just at the individual level, but at some level of scale where it can fit into uh, the investment profile of our partners. Uh, but I'd say overall, performance very strong. We're very excited. And I think this opportunity to translate pace you know, into the third party ownership market into some of these other places uh, opens up even more doors. Do you find your business community in the state is learning more about the opportunity of the PACE program and how to do more in the world there that has been sort of an educational curve, if you will, of the opportunities that PACE presents? You know, this goes to the broader question of, of standardization and scale, which is you know, how do you go from one off retailing, which is not the business we want to be in. You know, a lot of our is, is channel partners in terms of how do you uh, offer this finance uh, out to the market. I'd say the most encouraging sign is that our Capital partners, especially the local and regional banking partners, have said, you know, hey, this is an opportunity for us to sell something new to our property owners that's going to reduce their operating costs, uh, that's going to increase the value of their properties. And so, in fact, we'll open up our portfolios, you know, the, the commercial real estate uh, that we have in the state, to a partnership with Cephi as the Green Bank, uh, especially if we help be rich some of this stuff in the technology as well as a Writing perspective, um, and we're going to go out and, and bring this to our our, uh, our portfolio of properties. So that's a very exciting development. Okay. Chris, you worked on some of these very interesting deals, particularly involving real codes. Can you take us through one of you, maybe as a case study, on some of the real code deals, you know, explain exactly how it worked, or basically how it worked, or not be quite any great secrets. But talk to us what's involved and what you're hoping and what your what your goals are with those kind of transactions. Sure, I mean, as background. Things I was opening up access for a new base of investors to invest in attractive, typically renewable assets, and also it's an opportunity for a public vehicle and a company to actually access low cost capital in the public markets or private markets. And so, in terms of what a public yield code is, it effectively is a, a consolidation of attractive, renewable, and clean gas type assets. One of the case studies in the public markets today is NRG yield. Obviously, we follow the public markets are other yield codes that are on the road today, actually trying to price an IPO, and then there will be um, a handful of other public yield codes going out into the market this summer. Um, with respect to NRG yield, NRG Energy is a, a very large Fortune 500 energy company, and what they wanted to do was to highlight the value of contracted assets in their portfolio. And what they did was they created a company called NRG Yield and took that public in the New York Stock Exchange. It's a you know three gigawatt, three thousand megawatts of assets in the portfolio. It's a public company. The market has been very constructive, very receptive to uh, NRG Yield, along with some of its other peers like Pattern Energy. And the market will, in my opinion, continue to be very receptive as long as the um, capital markets are strong. They'll be very receptive to the other yield codes that are coming out this year. And so, what this public vehicle does is it allows investors to collect a dividend. And it's not as if this is a new concept, right? There's, there are, there's a company in the form of an LLP, there's a company in the form of an income trust in Canada. So, there are different vehicles that people have been using to buy and invest in renewable and Attracted assets. And so, what's different about this public yield code phenomenon today is that we've created through the NRG yield platform, with a sort of a case study, a template of what a public yield code should look like. So, you know, it's got to be stable, long term, attracted cash flows. You have to show visible growth, meaning that in your, in your growth vehicle, you have an ability to show investors that you will actually drop in additional assets to increase. Dividend. Um, there's also a, a function or mechanism where you tax, create a tax shield so that you're really creating a vehicle like an MLP because an MLP is a federally mandated, federally mandated company that, uh, you know, that actually doesn't, get to, doesn't have to pay tax. And so for a dividend paying company, having to pay tax is a very deleterious um, attribute. And so having a tax shield is very for not only the investors, but for the company itself. And so 
I think that's sort of the background, that's sort of the basics of what public deal code is. And, and do you see a trend that uh, the one deals that are coming along are going to try to be, as a Ben put it, sort of standardized, try to follow that template? Or are you still really seeing almost every company is sort of a unique situation? We're not yet at the point where we can look at these as a, as a standard, we still have a lot of work to do on each in terms of getting the public comfortable with them? Sure. Um, so getting into the details of what a yield co is today, NRG Energy was the first sort of big public yield co. I mean, you know, there was trans alpha renewables that went public in Canada. It set the template, now there are other variations of that, and so now you're seeing companies that are actually putting in certain, I would say, more attractive features depending on who you are, the company or the investor or the sponsor. And so when I mentioned the public yield go, I made it simple and say that you know it's a company created by Energy Energy. And so that suggests that there's a sponsor company, right? So there is a sponsor company that helps sort of incubate assets for this yield go. But now we are in a situation with Pattern Energy and some other year codes that are trying to go to market about or with companies that are standalone yield codes. And so they may not be a sponsor. You know, that, that will be a trend. And also there are financial mechanisms in these, in these yield codes, such as investment distribution rights. And so you will see public yield codes in market, in you know, trading, uh, whether it's NASDAQ or NYSC, with an IDR structure that's more common in the MLP space, where a sponsor, you know, gas, big, pipeline company, what they do is they create an MLP and they collect an incentive distribution right through a general partner structure. And so there are details like that that are being tweaked into these structures to make it more attractive as I said to whoever you look at it from the perspective of the investor, the sponsor, or the, the company itself. But uh, as I said, the markets are very constructive. The stock price for energy yield and pattern and you know, they priced above the range up to the IPO and today you're probably looking at a stock price for of NRG yield, I have a check today, it's probably around $50. Pattern Energy, price above the range at 22, and it's now trading at $30 plus. And so, there are companies like that. And so, you know, yield codes are interesting, but I also you know, follow a company called Solar City. They're a very exciting company as well. They're not necessarily a yield code, but their concept itself on the asset level, you know, in my opinion, that's a pretty good contracted cash flow. Um, for the investor, for the company, for the long term. And so you saw the securitization of Solar City, two securitizations in fact, um, you know, taking advantage of the low cost of capital. I've been a fan of securitization ever since bankers figured out how to securitize big movies and royalties. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Jessica, on the public side, one of the aspects of this is the laws, obviously, that govern these things. And, you know, we oftentimes we say what government is, let us do things or at least get out of the way. And there's been developments really in two of the devices that have really been hoped for in the, the mass release partnerships that have long been very successful in the history, in the energy industry, but so far not in renewable energy. And real estate investment trusts are also getting a lot of discussion within uh, renewable energy. And there's been some recent developments uh, from the IRS. Can you bring us up to date on those and what you see happening? Sure, well, I can try. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, it's certainly not just green banks that uh, you know are, are in innovative public-private partnerships. Where we're we're also in the business of um, opening up these asset classes to, to greater number of investors and greater pools. You know, we we, we want to work to open up um, other investment pools by clarifying some of the rules around these new technologies and new assets. So on the real estate front, um, I mean, we think about REITs um, as as potential investors. It's a very it's a good match for them. It's on the cash flow front. And and think about MLPs the same, it's low cost capital that, that did a lot for the development of pipelines and, and midstream assets when MLPs were aggregating those and, and are still a very big um, driver of development in those markets. Um, the IRS it took them a long time. Uh, something I was working on late 2011 through, through mid 2012 in the first Obama administration and, and trying to help them clarify whether solar and wind and utility scale and then, you know, as we move into small commercial and industrial classified as real property or personal property for investment purposes. So that we could open up, as we saw this huge expansion coming for solar deployment, uh, you know, $450 million asset class to, to be investors in the space. The IRS came out uh, last week with um, guidance that is now open for 
comment where they did a multi-factor analysis on two solar site examples, wind was not mentioned, where they said um, you know, that there's a functional use test that is being, uh, the, the modules, if it's a standalone solar energy site that is not feeding power into the building, but that is, or into a building, but that is, you know, out in the field somewhere in silly scale solar, um, the modules could not be readable because they're performing an active function of converting uh, to electricity. But the rest of the system, so about fifty percent of the cost, could be owned by a REIT. So you know, there's 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 some benefits to that, but it's not what we have hoped for. But the the real thing that that yes, there's more clarification that's required. But if there is a system that is designed for a building that is owned by a REIT and that it is feeding power into the building, um, and the REIT also owns that system, then the whole thing can be considered a system as whole as a whole, including the modules and that. Can so I think that opens up a lot more uh, low cost capital for the sector and it could be a really good thing uh, driving more investment in solar. And it's, you know, alongside, and, and I don't want to say about solar, but if we think about one of the most advanced financing chains in markets, I mean, you know, I, I was chatting with a developer the other day, he said, you know, it took us 10 years to get our first gigawatt out the door and, and we're going to do our next gigawatt this year globally. So, so it's really exciting and that's going to need to be financed and so this is a good move. Uh, one of the advantages you have in the New York Green Bank of course is starting with a clean slate. Uh, so we say, you know, learn from the mistakes of others, but you'll never live long enough to make them all from yourself. Or in Ben's case, learn from how others have done things as well. Are, are some of these programs out there that the, the Green Bank is starting to look at as you start to gear up, as you start to get proposals in that you find particularly interesting and exciting? To learn from their mistakes? Well, not your mistakes, but there was some um, you know, we're, we're learning a lot from uh, what Connecticut has done, uh, being able to bring in some of our local banks um, and, and looking to capital markets and securitization. Uh, we're looking to um, a lot of what the UK Green Investment Bank has done and, and those models, and, and we're, we're really trying to, to do some new things as well. And so we're a unique animal, and, and certainly um, are uh, gearing up to announce our first deals, which I think will provide clarification for the market on, on you know, what we can do and what we can't do. Because people really need to see kind of examples, I think, to, to get going on, on uh, you know, the fact that we really are flexible, open, and, and can be creative in the way that we engage the market and just trying to pull more capital into our participation. Yeah, let me ask a general question on the panel, and then we're going to throw it over. and really want to get everybody involved. One of the discussions that's going on here today as well as even in the mainstream press, is the change of the utility model generally. I mean, Barclays down pretty bad. Uh, Moody says it's really not a problem, but West End is the entire financial crisis. Um, are you seeing, in terms of opportunities, or coming to you concerns uh, that, that this is drawn, that the change in the utility model, the, the, the rise of micro business, some of these things might be driving some of the deals that are coming to you, some of the company concerns? Do you see these sort of uh, uh, changes in how? Our system is working, it's helping, or driving some of what's going on in trends? Certainly, you know, it's in New York State specifically, we, we are working to change the basic way in which utilities are paid, uh, and in which you know, they are incentivized now to, to be you know, capital efficient, and that's not the way it is in other sectors. And so, Many people don't know what that means, and are, are, but they do know that it means there's going to be more distributed power than there is now. We are prioritizing that we, we absolutely need to make sure that price signals work in the other direction and that we don't rip apart our grid and, and we're not seeing the value in having centralized generation, but certainly we are. And, and we want to, it's not distributed generation at any cost, um, you know, because that, with that comes great value destruction. So I think there's a balance, and then people are not saying, you know, let's, let's, let's run the hills as regards, you know, looking at, at um, centralized solutions, but, but we very much are going to be needed to finance smaller projects and distributed power as we move toward that model where there's more kind of two-way value chain between customers and their energy use and, and utilities. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> you just had a, a few thoughts on that, but sure. One, I think it's the 
single most important and fascinating question. It's a systems challenge, and it's something that uh, I think the, the New York leadership on this is, is actually quite tremendous, and it'd be fascinating to see how it develops. But a couple of comments, right? One is, one is for a hundred plus years, we've had really great uh, entities that know how to aggregate low-cost capital to do energy. Those are called utility companies. Um, and I think it's a, a, a poor, it's a short-sighted approach to get into a utilities, we want, we're trying to kill the utilities with renewables. It's not going to, right, both it's not going to work, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but, but more importantly, um, they are very strong essential partners in transitioning, especially if from the government side and the spirit of public-private partnerships, we can understand as uh, we make these transitions how, how to offer economic opportunity, real upside to utility companies and their shareholders by being part of the transition, right? So, you know, we, we all look at, you know, the fight going on in the state of Hawaii where Kiko's basically said, okay, no more, no more, you know, grid side installations. So we get in and, you know, PUC comes on top and says, no, no, you're going to have to do it. It's not an effective mechanism. Instead, you know, Connecticut, as we think about learning from places that are further ahead of us, uh, I think our major approach is, okay, if we're developing microgrids, who provides the services to that microgrid? How, does, how do they get funded? It seems like a natural utility function. Do we want to allow them into that? I, I would say yes. That might not be the official policy position of even my organization or state government. I don't know if we have them, but that's my perspective. You know, the same has to do with ownership of DR. The same has to do with ways in which you can benefit from energy efficiency and deliver that. I mean, these are, these are you know, to, to quote you know, uh, Jessica's boss's bosses. Boss, right? Only two levels up right now. When, when Richard Kaufman talks about this, and says, this is not about, it should not be about the commodity delivery of electrons, right? It's about energy as a service more broadly, and what are the roles that each of us play in a broader ecosystem. And at the end of the day, it's a regulatory fight going out for the next 20 years. We're both not going to achieve our goals, and um, it's going to be a really painful slog as opposed to trying to realign economic incentives to walk that path together. So. Yeah, no, I think utilities are fully aware that distributed generation is a threat. Um, you know, when we meet with utility clients and companies, distributed generation is definitely a top um, topic. We talk about distributed generation, whether they should invest in distributed generation, and how they can invest in distributed generation. And I think for now, it's still a very underpenetrated margin, like distributed generation only. You know, if you were to believe what the sole leasing companies are saying, you have probably less than, what, 1% national penetration. And so it's still a small piece of the puzzle, but I think everybody recognizes a piece of the puzzle to get to the product that we want, which is, you know, having the lights here, right? So I think utilities at some point will probably continue to invest and continue to see how it fits into their business. and. They're doing it today. Maybe they're not doing it in residential solar or resi, but they're doing, definitely doing it in CNI. There's certain utilities like Edison International. They they own a CNI developer, uh, NextEra. They own a CNI developer, Exelon does as well. And so there are lots of companies currently who do distributed generation. It's just again, it's a small market, and so utilities I think are focused on. You know, obviously the bottom line, that's what investors care about. And they're focused on making sure that their current business is focused and doing well. And they know that it's a threat, so they're aware. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, they're going to make sure that they have the right strategy in place to do the right thing. Okay. What I'd like to do now is I'd really like to get your questions for the panel. Um, all I can see is some bright lights if anybody has any hand raised. So you got one that way.
and create an asset bubble in it and cause a financial crisis. And I don't actually mean that, but I actually mean the, what's underlying that was just, you know, the problem that I had to take out of the financial crisis was not, well, the structures were part of it, well, the complexity was certainly part of it. Bank of America had nothing to do with it, it was on the other banks. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, all of it at the end of the day is based on some form of real asset analysis, right? And so my actual answer to your question is, well, we'll have some good underwriting standards and stick to them. And certainly from a public agency point of view, working in public private partnerships, trying to improve a market, our underwriting standards are public, we walk it through, we're walking through, we have to show them everyone, and, you know, that's what keeps us honest. Uh, and I feel very comfortable and confident saying that. But the pushback to your question is, um, you nonetheless want to be able to create effectively the same kind of machine that the mortgage folks did and, and use now to run markets. And so the balance there, I think, is a tricky thing. But I think it's a fascinating question broadly about where that where that line lies from another side of the line. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, certainly, just like we, we it's not renewables at any cost. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's it's certainly not uh, liquidity at any cost, right? I mean, we, we need to bring liquidity into these markets, and, and part of that is is the transparency and, and simplifying structure of standardization, um, growing this market in a smart way, um, in, in which you know we we're providing information on that. But what that ultimately is going to do is squeeze out risk premiums in the market, which is what the benefit of liquidity. And and right now we have perceived risk issue in financing these projects and so you know it's like Ben said it's just really a balance and I think there's no right answer but certainly we, we're going to learn from lessons past of other developing asset classes and, and where they may have gone wrong. Additional questions? Yes. And, and I would like to go back to the discussion about solar grids and uh, yes the concept to consider solar and a power plant as a real estate that's already in place in most of the country in Europe. Do you think that the same concept of consider, say, volumes or batteries can be applied to energy storage solutions to open up more investment for the chain? It's, it's difficult to say, really. You know, I think that um, the guidance that was just released is, is going to be helpful as regards how how the service thinks about property, but it's they're certainly not going to come out, uh, I don't think, and, and you know, clarify on every single technology what will classify and will not. And so companies might need to make their own decisions, um, certainly with, with the guidance about um, you know, whether they should file for a, a private letter or not. And the, the thing is uh, about REITs and opening up this asset class, the thing that complicates it um, is, is really the ITC. And, and talk about tax equity and, and think about you know what what value that adds to the market as it has grown but now it kind of extracts from the market and, and limits its growth in a way that it encourages us to be kind of one off and anachronistic in the way that we finance these projects. And so um, you know in a few years the ITC is is going to go away uh, as as is announced now. You know, I don't know whether um, it will be extended for a short while or not, but, but that'll be even more attraction for Greek to get involved in the space in which they can apply the solar rules to batteries or other technologies. Um, you know, and then if tax equity is still demanding the price that it is now in 2017, I would imagine that the market might start to more and more forego some of those benefits and look for other low cost low cost capital sources that are being developed in the market now. I mean I think I think financing mechanisms and governmental policies are really important, right? And so the ITC is very important having REITs and all these structures are and then in terms of you know financing mechanisms, you know, whether we create a tax equity structure that works for a certain investment versus the other investment, or we do these yield codes or securitization, they're all important. But I think ultimately for me, when I think about this regeneration, for instance, or storage, right? With we'll have bar batteries that allow people to store electricity all day and we can have fully off-grid electricity. I think it's all ultimately about costs, right? I mean, when, even when we do tax equity investment evaluations, right? We look at, you know, what's the cost of solar, right? You look at the appraisals and you say, what's the fair market value in each of these states? And 
you know, these days, let's call it 550 per watt fair market value. You know, that's, I don't know, I mean, that, that's still pretty expensive in my, in my view. And so if you're thinking about what Solar City is doing or what its peers are doing, you know, Sun Run, Bimmons, you know, they're trying to bring the cost structure down. And hopefully everybody can do that. And so hopefully, you know, with respect to storage, you know, bring on that cost so that customers really want it based on purely cost, not because they're going to get it for free, because behind the scenes you've got a fancy mechanism that allows you to get a product with no other cost. So I think it's all about cost. So I look at entrepreneurs and I am impressed with them. We're trying to bring down that cost structure and we're creating new technology so that we can have things cheaper. We're just about out of time. Um, I'd like to ask the panel if, if you like uh, sort of one party shot. Last year at this conference, when I was on the energy efficiency panel, I said at the end, the thing I'd really like to see is your ability to walk into a bank and get an energy efficiency loan with the same ease that you can get a car loan. And now you don't even have to go to a bank to get loans anymore. Anything you'd really like to see, anything you'd like to see Congress do, we're very blessed in uh, these states that we've been talking about, strong legislative and executive support. Really have in New York an executive and executive governor's chair who has seen energy is really important. Uh, really, for the first time in my life, we've had that strength and that leadership. Um, but what, if anything, uh, is on your wish list that you really think would be helpful or like to see happen or a trend that you'd like to see happen? You know, Ben's been looking for a bubble and a few other Any parting thoughts? Boy, what a terrible quote, Jesus. Yeah. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll say something which is that. Um, Personal point of view, I'm very interested in the equity questions associated with the transition to renewable energy. It sort of drives a lot of how I think about these questions. Every time a, a, a company raises a you know, raises the flag and says, "What we're getting is the death spiral because the rich folks are going to go off grid and it's going to hurt." You know, then we're going to get the whole story. The low income, multi-family properties, especially on residential sites. How do you deliver the benefits here?
intentional, not only for their appearance today, but for really being leaders and really are changing the world. Doesn't happen without finance. I want to thank Agrion for setting this up. One last shout out that I do want a personal thanks. I had the great pleasure during my time working with Agrion to work with Pamela, who was leaving after this event to head off to Yale. She has just done an outstanding job putting this panel together and putting other presentations together. Thank you for your efforts.